On July 17th, 2015, the Emperor Karl Franz jumped off the tabletop and took flight in a trailer for Total War Warhammer and subsequently for a lot of us, uh, also took flight right into her heart because the Empire has been a fan favorite faction of many throughout the existence of Total War Warhammer. So as you may have guessed already from the opening, yes, today we are covering the state of the faction for the Empire. This is a new series in which I cover the campaign starts, campaign mechanics, unit roster, and how that plays out in both campaign and multiplayer. And we are doing this for every faction, including those from game one and game two, both original factions and DLC. The order in which I'm moving, at least at the moment, is I'm starting an alphabetical order with the base game one faction. So we first did Dawi, today is Empire, and coming up next will be Greenskins and then Vampire Counts. Once we've done the base game factions for game one, we will move on to the DLC factions for game one, and then go on to do the same for game two. So let's cover today the Empire and how it has come around since game one and all the way through the end of game two and how are they situated with the release of game three? Will they stand up to all the new powerful units, lores of magic and campaign mechanics? Will they still be the bastion of men and that hope that the old world can look to or will they simply be brushed aside by something newer, shinier? Well, I guess maybe white and furry and icy. <laughs> We shall see, let's talk about the Empire. Let's kick things off by taking a look at the start positions for the Empire in Mortal Empires. Though so again, as a game one faction, a lot changed as game two evolved and more DLC and more races and lords and units and map changes. And as all these things took place, it left the Empire behind. However, CA did take the time to make some really important changes to the Empire that really kind of brought them more up to speed with the game two factions in terms of their campaign um, mechanics and their campaign start positions. Let's take a quick look at those start positions. And then we'll take a look at those mechanics I talked about. But let's start with Mortal Empires. Karl Franz and Volkmar do both start in control of Altdorf. So a little bit of a miss here, uh, similar to the dwarves in the sense that Volkmar still does not have a unique faction or start position. However, they did add one for Balthasar Gelt, um, putting him in Solon. And it really is an interesting start because he starts off close to a lot of dwarves, vampires, greenskins, the southern realms. Uh, there's all kinds of fun stuff going on for him, and it does make that a more unique feel. And then, of course, uh, coming in a DLC in Game 2 to compete with his Lizardmen counterparts, Marcus Wolfhart joined to hunt down the Lizard Beast in Lustria and bring riches and glory to the Empire and also gave a new start position for the Empire and one that is quite fun and a playstyle that's quite fun. So I feel like the addition of Wolfhart was much needed it brought the Empire into the Vortex campaign, which I'll show you that start position in just a moment. Um, but it also allows you in Mortal Empires to have a start in Lustria where you're going to be facing off against Lizardmen, Dark Elves, Savage Greenskins, and all kinds of other enemies like Skaven and Vampire Coast. So it gives you a totally different experience and a different Lord type as well as Wolfheart is an archer. Speaking of, let's uh, we'll talk through the Lord types a little bit more later, but this gives us an idea of their start positions. Um, so again, pretty good here. Not perfect because Volkmar doesn't have his own, but pretty good because they made one for Balthasar and then they added in Wolfhart, which gives an additional start position as well. And now Wolfhart does start in nearly the same place in the Eye of the Vortex campaign. So again, gives another way for the players to enjoy Empire. He gets to bring in shipments of troops and equipment from the main uh, portion of the Empire. It's really fun play style, um, acting as a colony. And of course, you know, it, you're not trying to do, um, uh, what do you call it, vortex rituals and stuff. So it's a little bit different. Um, so it gives the players something different and something fun to enjoy with Empire. And again, kind of brought them up to speed with game two by adding them into the Eye of the Vortex narrative campaign. 
Now in the campaign, in order to make them feel a little bit more like a game two faction and give them a unique mechanic, Creative Assembly came in and added a couple of things. First off is the Elector Counts. This is cool because it kind of plays into the lore uh, behind the Empire, the different Elector Counts that were involved there. Carl Franz is who I'm playing as now, but of course you can play as Balthasar. And essentially you can try to manage your relationship with all the different Elector Counts in these different regions. And it tells you where they're an electric count. So like for instance, Manfred starts out as the electric count, electric count, sorry, electric count of Sylvania. Electric vampire does sound pretty cool though. Sounds like a, a, a Sylvania nightclub. Um, but in any case, uh, when you capture or confederate and essentially take control of um, these different um, counties uh, in the, the empire, um, you can, if you confederate him, of course, you get to use that lord. Of course, you can't confederate Manfred. Um, but if not, you get to take on a special uh, a special piece of equipment. And then you also get to uh, get a special unit that can be recruited there. It's a really cool system because it added more units to the Empire that are campaign exclusive and are a whole lot of fun. Like, for instance, these Knights of Moor. Um, very cool unit, immune to psychology, uh, do very nice charge damage. It's a variant of Empire Knights. Um, and then, of course, you know, again, there's a special piece of equipment that you get for taking on um, each one. And you can appoint elector counts. So for instance, if you knock Manfred out and take control of Sylvania, you can of course appoint one of your generals to be the elector count of Sylvania. It's a really cool system. Uh, there's a lot of unique units and you know, like Eldred's Guard Spears from Balthasar, Stir River Patrol, which is flaming crossbowmen, uh, Knights of the Everlasting Light, it's a magic attack, um, Empire Knights, really cool unit. Uh, you got Sutsun's Mortars, which don't do any friendly fire. I mean, really cool units. Gundam and Surefires. Again, lots of really awesome units. Um, it, it creates a, an interesting feel, um, gives the player something fun to take care of. Uh, and then you earn this currency here of prestige, and you can use that currency to improve your relations with the other members of the Empire, the other Elector Counts, if you will. Um, you can use it to decrease relations between others. So basically, it's similar to the High Elves, um, you know, influence that they have, but a little bit different and fun. So is this as great as some of the Game 2 add-ins like Grom's uh, Kitchen and, you know, Ikit Claw's Laboratory? No, maybe not quite as cool as those, but it's pretty fun. And in my opinion, definitely makes the Empire a fun campaign to play in Game 2 and was an excellent addition in bringing the Empire pretty much up to snuff with the other factions and races in the game. Well, we've taken a look at campaign starts and we've also taken a look at campaign mechanics in which at least I'm of the opinion that the Empire is in pretty good shape. I wouldn't say the best shape, but pretty solid. Like going, getting ready for game three, they're, they're pretty much on, on par. So let's talk a little bit about their roster and how it stacks up as of basically game two being completely delivered to us since we're no longer getting any more DLCs or other additions. I'll come back to Lords and Heroes last and talk about those. Let's start off with the basic unit rosters outside of the Lords and Heroes. As far as infantry goes, the Empire is not terrible, but they are not stellar. In fact, they probably live a little closer to the terrible line than they do the stellar line. You're not going to get the strongest infantry in the game when you use the Empire. However, you do have good options and they are pretty affordable. Even their most expensive unit, Great Swords, for instance, come at a pretty reasonable price and do pretty reasonable damage. And so while they won't just go out and truck your enemies with sheer power, Empire Infantry is flexible and useful. Um, spearmen do nice anti-large damage. Swordsmen are just a good uh, early game unit. And then Halberds uh, can provide some AP anti-large as well. Flagellants provide an unbreakable line that does pretty good damage to low armor units. Um, and then great swords provide your armor piercing, uh, more dedicated anti-infantry variant. Now in terms of missile infantry, the empire is very interesting. Uh, you know, kind of in some ways comparable to the dwarves, they have a lot of options available to them. Um, not probably quite as varied with the dwarves because you don't have stuff like iron drakes, um, but still interesting nonetheless. Uh, as of recent, more recent additions, you had archers come in, which are just a very cheap ranged unit. These guys can be very effective in early campaign when spammed as missile units are just pretty powerful in early campaign. One of my favorite units that's been here for quite a while, Free Company Militia. It's not an AP gun unit and it doesn't have long range, but it basically fights about like a swordsman in melee combat, but then has the missile attack to boot. 
Very fun unit for early game. Crossbowmen provide pretty decent mid-range option that can skirmish well with other factions. And then of course you have handguns, which do dedicated AP damage. Very good at knocking out enemy lords and monsters as long as they have a good line of sight. And then added as of the Wolfheart uh, DLC, Huntsmen, which are an anti-large variant of archers and a very fun unit indeed, giving the Empire yet more specialty ghouls for killing enemy beast and monsters. When it comes to cavalry, again, the Empire isn't the world's best, but they're a pretty solid entry. They used to pretty much just be the best until Demigriff Knights got a little bit nerfed over time, but still a very solid uh, cavalry force. They don't really do um, light melee cavalry, but we'll look at some of their light missile cavalry here in a moment. Empire Knights come in as the first entry here. It's just a good, solid, hard-hitting charge. Nothing insane, but at this cost level, pretty good. Reichsguard come in with a premier charge and armor. Uh, very good against infantry and smashing infantry. Uh, not great against cavalry. And then there's a specialized variant of them, which is the Knights of the Blazing Sun, which come with flaming weapon damage and even more charge, but at a lack of a little bit more armor. And then you're going to move on to Demigriff Knights. There is a Lance variant, which is armor piercing and high charge. Very good at taking down infantry. Um, and armored infantry, whereas the Demigriff Knights with Halberds have less charge, but then pack uh, or pack in some extra wallop against lo um, large targets um, because they have the dedicated anti-large damage and AP. Demigriff Knights were probably hands down the best anti-cavalry tool and anti-large tool in the game for a long time. They are still extremely good um, and definitely a go-to and one of the Empire's strengths, in my opinion, but and they were nerfed over time. Uh, Pistoliers, a great entry here, very good against low armor. They can fire in a 360 degree arc, they're fast moving, and they are a real nuisance. And then Outriders are a very interesting one because these guys are basically mounted handguns. Now they can only fire forward and they have a limited range of 130. They do extremely good damage against armored targets, a very useful unit indeed. And then the grenade launcher variant of those Outriders, providing some really excellent infantry cleaning abilities. So if you clean out the enemy of their missiles and cavalry, Outriders are absolutely devastating to the remaining infantry. A tricky unit to use, but a deadly unit. War Wagons were added with Wolfheart. Pretty controversial. I've made some videos about these guys. They're actually not bad under certain circumstances. I think earlier in the campaign, they're pretty solid because it's hard for the enemy to kill. Um, but a lot of people in the end tend to prefer handguns because they can just out, output more damage. You have a mortar variant of the war wagon uh, as well, which provides a mobile artillery platform. And speaking of artillery, it is one of the places where the Empire shines. They do have a lot of options, and most of them are quite decent. Mortars come in cheap and provide you pretty decent mid-range, if not close to long range. It's anti-infantry and anti-skirmisher capability. Great cannons provide a very nice anti-large armor piercing, very long range variant at 450 range. It's a fantastic unit. Hellblaster volley guns are excellent against expensive infantry and single entity monsters. They do sacrifice some range, but they dish out massive damage. Hellstorm rocket batteries are insane when it comes to cleaning up infantry and probably one of the best artillery units in the game in terms of cleaning up infantry. Extreme range, very nice damage, including armor piercing. A very nice unit indeed. Um, the Luminarch of Hish, a very niche artillery unit that is basically a couple of magic um, priests on a chariot that shoots lasers. I mean, I, I don't know a better way to describe it, but this is a absolute lord and single entity monster deleter with the downside that it is slow to fire and slow to move. But if you can protect it, this thing absolutely annihilates single entity targets in just a couple of shots usually is a fantastic unit, very fun, very niche to use. Um, and then last but not least, you've got the Steam Tank, um, which is a very cool hybrid melee slash artillery platform, which essentially acts as a chariot in combat and a very neat unit for the Empire. Very powerful, very expensive, provides nice long range damage and secondary melee capability. And then of course we have all of the uh, units that come in via the campaign, including ogres and the specialty units from all the different counties within the empire. So as far as the roster goes, the empire is a jack of all trades and really pretty much a master of none. Though I would say when it comes to magic, they're probably at a master level. And we'll talk about that now because we're gonna talk about heroes. Before we get to the magic heroes though, let's start off with the empire captain. 
a very cost-effective cheap hero who can help your state troops, these spearmen, swordsmen, halberds, fight for longer, be inspired. Uh, they can be mounted on a horse. They can also be mounted on a pegasus for more mobility. They do not do armor piercing or anti-large, but again, for the price, you really can't hardly go wrong. Witch Hunters, a less used hero. They used to be used a lot whenever their ability was OP. This Accusation, which is a direct damage. Well, it used to be direct damage. Now it's not. Um, now it just debuffs. So Witch Hunters, not as much used. They went from being very powerful to not, not very common. They have a short-range pistol attack that's pretty strong, pretty weak in melee. Fun to use in the campaign, but hasn't found a lot of use in multiplayer. Whereas the Warrior Priest started off as something not often used, but now very much used. Because once again, at a reasonable price, you can bring in a Warrior Priest, get rid of some of the abilities that you don't need. You can keep this Hammer of Sigmar, for instance, and the Soul Fire. And for 588, you get a supporting hero that can call in a bombardment and buff the attack of nearby troops. It is pretty awesome. And the Warrior Priest is a really nice addition to the Empire roster and helping the state troops be more effective and helping them take on tougher foes. So really nice options in terms of melee heroes. You also have Gotrek and Felix. Um, we talked about these guys on the Dwarf roster. I'm not really going to cover them again um, since they're there. But let's move on to one of the funnest parts about the Empire, which is their Colleges of Magic. The Empire has access to a ton of lores of magic, and it makes them, like I said, they're the jack of all trades and the master of none. When it comes to magic, I mean, except for maybe the High Elves, the Empire is basically the master of magic. I think the High Elves are the ones that maybe come with even more. Um, over time, they added in more lores of magic, um, but I think, um, I don't remember exactly all the ones that were there at the start. I know they had Light, Heavens, and Fire. Um, and then I believe they added in the Grey Wizard, the Jade Wizard, the Amber Wizard, and the Amethyst Wizard. So four more lores of magic, which included lore of Shadows, Life, uh, Beast, and Death, um, which really adds this huge variety to the Empire. It makes it very fun to play in campaign and also gives you a ton of flexibility in battle. Let's say you're going to play against a faction that is terrible at healing and they rely on their leaders. Well, a uh, Amethyst Wizard can use stuff to help kill enemy units and take away um, their uh, their hit points and, and unit models and stuff using the Lore of Death. Um, the Amber Wizard can summon in um, Manticores. It can use Flock of Doom. The Jade Wizard can heal your key units. The Grey Wizard can help clear out infantry lines with Pit of Shades and Pendulum and do debuffs like Melkoth's Miasma. The Bright Wizard can burn through enemy lines with the Burning Head, the Flame Storm, Piercing Bolts of Burning, Fireball. Um, the Celestial Wizard used to be worth a lot more until they nerfed the Wind Blast spell. Still fun to use in campaign, a little less useful uh, in multiplayer. And then the Light Wizard, of course, being able to buff friendly units and pin down enemy units with a very popular Net of Amentok spell which can be quite useful in multiplayer and in campaign. So the Empire, definitely a huge specialist faction in terms of heroes. They have a lot of different specialists, and that's where they're going to excel. Their infantry won't win them the day, but their support units between like their good cavalry, artillery, and magic is what will win you the day. Um, and then let's get to lords and talk about them. There's a few generic lords here. I say a few. There's three, I believe. Um, you've got the General of the Empire, the Huntsman General, and the Arch Lector. Let's talk about these. The General of the Empire is basically a better Empire Captain. Cheap, effective, can be mounted all the way up to a Imperial Pegasus um, or, you know, a Warhorse. Uh, fun unit uh, to play as. Um, you got the Huntsman General, which of course cannot be mounted, but acts like a dollar store version of Marcus Wolfhart and can give good support to range units. Uh, and then you have the Arch Lector. Uh, which is essentially a stronger version of the Warrior Priest and a pretty cool addition to the Empire roster. So nice generic lords giving you three different options, a melee support option, a melee option, and a ranged option. So it gives the Empire a lot of um, fun uh, capability. Now let's talk about legendary lords. We say legendary lord, Boris isn't playable on the campaign map. I guess he's kind of a legendary lord that you can pick for the Empire. Uh, Boris can be mounted on an Imperial Griffin. He distinguishes himself um, from Karl Franz by having a special item ability here, which is the Middenland Runefang, in which he heals. Um, so Boris has long been a fun pick for players of the Empire when they need something that can heal. Uh, Balthasar brings in the Lore of Metal, which is interesting because Lore of Metal, otherwise not available to the Empire for some strange reason, only Balthasar. 
And uh, I will say that I'm disappointed that Balthasar still doesn't have special capabilities with the Lore of Metal. He is essentially just like any other Lore of Metal caster, with the one exception being his Staff of Volans, which is quite good at pulling in extra winds of magic. Balthasar is very weak in melee, but he is a force to be reckoned with when it comes to magic. He can be mounted on war horses and then also Quicksilver, his special Pegasus, uh, that is very fast moving and allows him to fly around the battlefield with haste. Karl Franz uh, is the quintessential general of the Empire. He can be mounted on Deathclaw, which provides a very cool single entity monster for the Empire that they badly need. He is pretty strong, but the uh, with the coming of dragons, Karl was no longer the uh, the real melee lord of the skies. But when combined with something like a uh, a Jade Wizard that can do a regrowth spell, he is still a force to be reckoned with in melee, especially when using his special abilities of Galmaraz and the Reichlin Runefang, so he is very capable. You got Marcus Wolfhart who came in with a DLC. Fun way to play the Empire between uh, using a Light Wizard with Net of Amontok and Wolfhart's own abilities here, which is the Hunter Snare and his abilities to snipe and take down enemy, um, enemy hit points. Wolfhart uh, can be a very fun lord to play. He's pretty decent at helping to get rid of monsters and provides the Empire with a different style of play. Volkmar has become a huge go-to for multiplayer Empire players. Uh, he has this magic chariot he can be mounted on, and he has some abilities here too, like the Jade Griffin that help him heal, and he is very difficult to kill. When he is on his chariot mount, uh, he gets a significant uh, missile resistance and magic resistance, which makes him difficult to defeat, and it also makes him unbreakable. He is very capable against infantry, and he is difficult to slow down and stop unless you have your own large targets. Um, he is a very potent lord and a very popular pick among multiplayer players at the moment. But anyway, that covers the Empire roster. How does their roster stack up? Well, in my opinion, the Empire, although probably weaker than they were at the launch of Total War Warhammer, um, by the time we got to the end of Total War Warhammer 2, they're still a very capable faction, both in campaign and in multiplayer. They're still a popular pick. They require a fair bit of micro in multiplayer because you're not gonna just have a line that can hold people off. You're gonna have to use those specialists and micromanage your way through the battle, but in capable hands, the Empire is very deadly and faces off well against most other factions in the game. Again, when in capable hands, when in the hands of an average player, they are still playable and fun. Um, it's just going to take you a little more effort to try and pick armies that are a little bit safer. Um, they do have very nice range options, cavalry options. Having a little bit of everything makes it a little bit easier for new players to get used to the Empire versus them being more of a specialist faction like some others. Um, so I feel like the Empire is a good faction both for very skilled players and for very new players. And I also feel like they are a very good faction in campaign and they are a good faction in multiplayer. So overall, I would say that the Empire is in a great place uh, headed into game three. I don't think that they really need a whole lot more. Um, maybe just a unique start for Volkmar. Uh, maybe a couple of other units that get dropped in over time as different DLCs roll into Warhammer 3. Um, and perhaps maybe a few updated campaign mechanics. Um, but not bad. Again, not bad. I would say nothing urgent for the Empire. I think they're in a good place. And if you're looking to have a fun campaign, both as a beginner or a veteran, the Empire is a good place to go. And again, if you're into multiplayer, still a good faction to go with and fun to learn. Hope this was helpful. Make sure you get down in the comments and tell me what you think about the Empire. And make sure you stay tuned because we will have more State of the Faction videos coming in January. I'm going to cover every faction. And I hope you're here for it because I know I'm here for it. And it's going to be a lot of fun. Air of Carthage signing up for now. I will see you soon.